Good morning, everyone. A big welcome to each one of you to AMNC's Blockchain for Supply Chain session. I love it that a predominant male audience needs to listen to an all-female panel. That's great. Right? So, blockchain and supply chains. Um, providing increased transparency, efficiency, and interoperability across supply chains has been one of the most fertile areas for blockchain experimentation. It also has both opportunities and challenges in realizing those transformative potential that distributed ledger technology and blockchain can bring to the supply chain ecosystem. I'm Nadia Hewitt. I'm with the blockchain team at the Forum's Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And our mission at the center is to ensure that we maximize the benefits for society and reduce the risk of advanced technology and science. We have a few projects related to blockchain um, for supply chain at the forum. You'll have, there's handouts if you wanted to read more details on that. Our approach is a multi-stakeholder approach. If you look around you at the participants today, it's a gathering of a very diverse group of people. I see a few multinational organizations, see startup and blockchain technology, um, academia from Korea, as far as you know, uh, Namibia, Southern Africa. So just think of if we convene a broad multi-stakeholder community to co-design, pilot, and scale blockchain use cases which can advance the most impactful use cases in a way that is strategic and forward-thinking and that includes those countries and economies and companies across the economic spectrum. To get an idea of who we have in the room, by a show of hands, who of you uh, work in supply chain today or are impacted by the supply chain? Okay, nice. Uh, blockchain, who of you in your companies or in your role are talking about blockchain, you're observing the potential of blockchain, or perhaps you're already even doing some proof of concepts? Any of you? Okay, so some of you may agree that within blockchain in supply chain, many of the projects so far have been a result of the efforts of one or two companies that is trying and focusing on their own interest without considering the you know, unintended consequences or downstream, upstream impact of other parties or the system as a whole. Well, that really results in a fractured system where parts of, this, parts of the sector um, is left behind while only some benefits from the economic efficiency gains. So at the center, our focus is that inclusive approach. I also wanted to say we don't assume that blockchain technology is the right technology to use. That's not the um, objective here. Instead, where blockchain has a business case and where it really solves problems, our intention is to make sure that an inclusive approach is taken to maximize the benefits for everyone. So, while today our speakers will be thinking outside of the blocks, Really, the purpose of this session is to hear from you. We want to generate ideas, insights, and really just raise awareness to this project in the, the area, the focus. So we welcome your input. I'll also be, um, at the end, I'll be outside if anybody wants to come and already discuss. But we welcome your input so that we can collectively work towards, um, you know, using blockchain in the supply chain ecosystem, not only for the whole society to benefit. And with that, I want to hand it over to our moderator, Yan Ching. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nadia, very much. And uh, um, we have a very good beginning, and we have a, a big lady group. And I hope that gentlemen will join us uh, as early as possible. And we know that when the uh, uh, cryptocurrency and crypto assets like the Bitcoin 
has become a kind of a mainstream asset uh, from a kind of uh, a mysterious thing from the nerds and from the criminals several years ago. Now everyone is thinking about, is talking about the uh, blockchain technology and the uh, cryptocurrency and digital currency, these kind of issues, and a lot of craze there. But uh, maybe the underlying technology of the uh, crypto assets, cryptocurrency, which is the uh, uh, distributed ledger and blockchain uh, has been uh, misunderstood a little bit, especially in China. So I think it is very uh, interesting today that we can have an international community and also have a, a bigger background and bigger um, um, space for us to talk about the uh, blockchain, especially in the areas like the uh, supply chain and like the uh, um, uh, trade finance, these kind of issues. So we know that the 90% uh, of the goods in global trade are carried by the shipping industry and the cost of the processing of the documents and information for uh, container shipment is, is is uh, estimated at more than twice of the cost of the uh, transport itself. So we are uh, going to uh, discuss our panel and also all of you. We're going to uh, discuss and debate what is needed to accelerate blockchain and other distributed ledger technologies to bring efficiency, uh, transparency, and uh, interoperability to global uh, supply chains. We have uh, a great panel here, and the, uh, um, to my left, Catherine um, Maligan. Yeah, my uh, pronunciation is right. She is the, yeah, yeah, she's the co-director of the Center for Cryptocurrency Research and Engineering, Imperial College of London of the UK. So, so she is the expert uh, both on blockchain and also on the uh, cryptocurrency and digital currency. Thank you for coming and joining us. And uh, 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 next to her, uh, Leon Camp. She is the uh, uh, chief uh, executive officer and founder of the uh, uh, Avalanger uh, United Kingdom too. Thank you for your for your coming. And the, uh, uh, then uh, Irene Arias. She is the uh, also CEO of the uh, multinational investment fund uh, MIF uh, F O uh, M I N. Uh, actually Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, she's based in Washington DC. Thank you for, for coming. The last but not least, um, Rebecca Liao. She is the uh, a vice president of the business development and strategy of a uh, school chain uh, of the United States. Thank you, thank you for, for coming. And before we start a discussion, I uh, would encourage all of you to write down one word or think about one word when you, uh, uh, when you think of blockchain and supply chain respectively. So give you one minute. Please write down something. And maybe our panel can also write down one word on supply chain and blockchain respectively, each. So let's look at the results. The gentleman, what is your word? Transparency for the blockchain or for the supply chain? Supply chain. Then what about the blockchain? Maybe this. Maybe oh. confidence. No governance. And so if I look at it from a city standpoint, uh, providing new services and governance through that. Thank you very much. Um, lady here? Yeah, for both. Um, I think of safety. So in, in various capacities, I work in pharmaceuticals and, you know, there's the track and traceability laws in the U.S. So I, th I think of safety and consumer safety. Also data. for the blockchain or the supply chain. Bo so both. So both. blockchain obviously is more secure. So there's, you know, data safety and, and I think also for consumers and supply chain. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we will uh, engage you a little later and uh, talk about your word and also uh, ask for your comments and questions uh, a bit, maybe a, bit a little later. So to the panelists, Catherine, what is your word? Uh, 
I chose one word for both, which is complex. And complex. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and that, that, that's because I think it's a little bit more difficult than just uh, everyone thinks initially. So yeah. Yeah, agree, Leon. Uh, microeconomics. Macroeconomics and a mandatory policy, maybe. Smart, smart contract or something. Yeah, great. And uh, uh, Irene? I mean, the obvious one, trust. Trust. Great. And Rebecca? Okay. So I had a word for both as well, and that's value. Um, so I think that blockchain is over the hype cycle at this point, and particularly in the enterprise space, every company is asking, how exactly are you going to provide value to me through blockchain technology? Thank you very much. I think it's a very starting point for our uh, discussion today. So I will um, uh, directly go to our uh, topic now. So uh, when we talk about the uh, cryptocurrency and a lot of the uh, craze and a lot of regulation there, and also uh, a, a lot of the bubble in the investment into blockchain now in China, but maybe uh, not that big bubble in, in the rest of the world. So to all panelists, why do you think that the uh, blockchain may be or might be the, the best technology for the global supply chain, including the uh, uh, trade finance and including of the trade and customs and uh, payment and everything? So maybe, um, Catherine? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so I think I usually say that blockchain, um, you know, if you compare the original or the uh, earlier versions of digital technologies, those are very much about using, the using information technology to do the same business processes faster and more efficiently. Um, blockchain is really about fundamentally redefining how we do business. And for me, the supply chain is one of the most natural areas to start applying that because it's about how you share information and exchange value between companies. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I, might, I might be the, the negative in the room. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that it is, um, it, particularly if we start thinking about physical supply chains. Um, the importance of blockchain, certainly it's not a single layer technology. When we peel back what blockchain is, it involves you know, primitives of cryptography and consensus mechanisms and ways upon which you can hash and store data. But the reality is, in a physical world, unless we can marry material science or ways of having an identity of an object beyond just serialization of barcoding or, or RFID tags, the actual DNA of an object or a fingerprint, then I actually think maybe blockchain will spin out of control and cause a whole lot more problems in the world. True. So, you know, I'm compelling that... Uh, uh, that the blockchain needs to be looked at in a symphony of technologies rather than it being a single point, you know, solution to the, to the, to the new world that we want to operate in. Um, in terms of the uh, macro economy and macroeconomics, uh, would you elaborate maybe a little further for your pessimistic view towards the blockchain instead of the uh, craze here? So I think... Um, we, I'm not an economist, but actually Catherine is, so we can riff and raff on this across the better part of the next, you know, two or three minutes. Um, there are very interesting new business models uh, and value creation mechanisms that can be put into place when we start to marry the types of poor IR technologies together. So macroeconomics are very well spoken about and increasingly researched. But if you consider the diamond industry for a prime example, uh, rough is extracted out of the earth at about 15 billion a year. And it runs through the pipe chain um, where the rough and polished is about 47 billion. And by the time it ends up in a polished stone, not yet set in, an, in a jewelry piece, it's about $70 billion, $80 billion. Um, the reserves of profits within industry reside within hyper-consolidated geographical locations in the world. 80% of the diamonds are effectively cut and polished in one location in India, Surat, Mumbai. Um, and of course, you know, a lot of the macroeconomics of that industry are regarded into profits of the, the very large. But if you start to consider how can we engage with artisanal small-scale mining companies in countries that have some of the richest source of Mother's Earth's assets and marry the trust and traceability into the hands of some of the largest luxury brands in the world, then incredible microeconomics, um, value chain creation can occur where you start to apply that technology uh, first. So, yeah, thank you, Aliyan. Uh, Irene, do you agree yeah. with... Um, I, maybe just to offer something that is uh, a bit to counterbalance what, what you said in, of the limits of blockchain for, for supply chains. Um, where we see a huge advantage is, that, is in um, bringing out the 
immutability, the transparency, the traceability, and the visibility that blockchain can provide. Um, and it may not solve the entire problem, um, but it, for example, we are doing practical use cases in terms of customs administration. Uh, we have a program in Latin America called Cadena that's applying that in Costa Rica, Mexico, and Argentina. And frankly, I think even if we solve just for that and increase the, um, the transparency, it would dramatically reduce uh, times, it would reduce opportunities for fraud, for corruption. And so even if you, if you still have some limitations in terms of, for example, the identity of the physical goods, um, just solving for that, it's a huge, huge improvement for, for the chain. And similarly, and that's something that we're doing with, with the WEF and the, and the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, um, in terms of the export agencies that need to validate and need to uh, provide export permits, um, it's again another segment where uh, um, testing um, how blockchain can improve the, the speed and the transparency um, of, um, of, of those permits and make it in a way that is also interoperable with one-stop shops in the other countries. Um, you, I, I think the benefits uh, for particularly a region like Latin America where still uh, the fragmentation of market is tremendous um, and I think there is, there is a lot to, to gain and, first of all, to learn from these practical examples. I think that's uh, maybe the main message that we just need to start applying it and, and learn from it. Yeah, thank you. Um, Rebecca? What was the original question? <laughs> Um, okay, so I, uh, I'll tell you from our experience, so we've been doing supply chain and blockchain for about four years now. And when we first started off, the thought was we were going to target tracking and tracing of goods. So transparency, traceability for things like food safety or ensuring the quality of goods, proving provenance, all these things are incredibly important for the supply chain. Uh, so when we started to implement these systems with our customers, uh, what they began to tell us in terms of feedback was, well, um, you know, these physical goods don't move on their own. They move according to firm orders, to forecast, to purchase orders, invoices, et cetera. So how do you account for that? So then we discovered that we needed to integrate smart contracts into, um, into the solution as well. Um, and then we started to uh, actually move the goods, and then we discovered that there's this whole financing layer on top of supply chain. And not only that, but in order for you as a large anchor buyer, for instance, you have the most power in a supply chain, allegedly, but getting your suppliers to actually move and adopt this technology is a challenge. And so how do you incentivize them to adopt blockchain? You may think it's a cool technology. Your suppliers see it as a tax. I have to get trained on this new solution. I don't understand this technology. What's in it for me? And that's when new business models unlocked by blockchain technology become really important within the supply chain context. So we do all of that. Now the customers are asking, well, why do I need SAP? Why do I need my old enterprise resource planning system? This resource planning system has been around for 20, 30, 40 years in some cases. This sounds like a new technology that could replace that. So I think that's where this is going. Um, and that's certainly where we're going as a company. And um, so what we're seeing is while blockchain was supposed to address specific pain points in supply chain, what we're finding is that these companies are seeing the potential of blockchain technology. That's not to say that it's going to solve every supply chain problem or that you should replace your current um, enterprise resource planning system with something that's blockchain based. But what we're seeing is that companies are starting to see the more expansive vision and moving in that direction. Uh, would you uh, like to highlight maybe some points that the blockchain can solve the problems that we cannot solve use other uh, technologies we have had in supply chain and, use, and, and also including the uh, trade finance in that area? Absolutely. Um, so all problems that blockchain solves within the supply chain context emanate from the same theme, which is that there's a coordination problem within supply chain. Most of the time, the way that planning is done across the supply chain is point-to-point -point communication. So you, as the anchor buyer, you probably have a pretty strong relationship with your next immediate supplier, your tier one supplier. This is generally a larger company, um, and you work with them directly. Beyond that, you start to lose visibility immediately, and that impacts your planning, your forecasting. There are a lot of inefficient decisions made as a result. There are supply outages, et cetera. If you were able to collaboratively plan, 
then this would solve a lot of problems. And what blockchain is uniquely positioned to do is to allow you to collaborate as though you had access to everybody's data within this ecosystem without actually having access to the underlying data itself. So with the security aspects of blockchain technology, as well as some of the other bells and whistles that come along with that, you're able to solve that key problem. Now, with that coordination, you get traceability, you get proof of provenance, um, you're also able to transact um, in a collaborative way. And so to execute these transactions in a more automated and coordinated manner. And of course, with respect to trade finance and supply chain finance, you unlock new business models that are based on the risk of assets that you had zero visibility into before. If you could know the title, the nature, the quality of the goods, all the way upstream in your supply chain, all of that becomes collateral for supply chain finance. And the nice thing about blockchain, which we can talk about in more detail later, is that the lowest cost of capital in the supply chain gets applied across the entire supply chain. If you have a deep supply chain where there's a huge differential in cost of capital between the buyer and your suppliers, this is a lot of economic value that can be unlocked just with the adoption of this technology. Thank you, Rebecca. I think that uh, you are right that uh, we can use the blockchain to solve a lot of problems of the uh, uh, supply chain. But maybe the starting point is that the uh, blockchain is paperless. There's no need for us to, to write every the data, every detail, and everything of the shipment on the paper. And uh, everyone's looking at the paper and check the paper once, when, once again and once again. That's the reason why the cost of the, uh, of the uh, shipment is twice uh, the twice the price of the, uh, the shipment itself. So I think maybe the starting point, digitization. And the second, I think that maybe first, uh, before the blockchain can be uh, phased in, uh, there are two parties, they speak to each other one-on-one, -on -one, and another party one-on-one. -on -one. But if we have the blockchain, so it's a multi-party, so that everybody can talk simultaneously. So maybe I think that is starting point as a layman for me to understand why blockchain is so useful for us to um, maybe transform the, uh, the uh, global trade, global supply chain into a new one based on the uh, supply chain. So um, Irene, so because you have a lot of good experience in the uh, Argentina example, right? So would you elaborate a little bit on, um, um, on, on it? Um, why? It is so successful. What kind of the problems we have been solved, and also what kind of efficiency and we can have, and so just just your your, your take on that. Mm. So f first of all, I think, and perhaps because of Argentinian history, and I don't know if there are any Argentinians in the room, but. The, uh, uh, not a very stable macro environment and, and so on, and that led to sort of a big pickup in terms of um, originally sort of cryptocurrency. And, and, but frankly, that has led, uh, we, we, we operate and we work on sort of non-crypto applications of blockchain, but we benefit from those earlier sort of, um, entrepreneurs and, and people that got involved in crypto because they have a magnificent expertise in blockchain. Um, and so that, to begin with, you do have sort of the understanding, the capacity in Argentina to do that. Um, but you also have, a, since to get the benefit from everything we're talking about uh, in terms of decentralized um, consensus protocols that create that trust and allow for that collaboration between the actors, you need to uh, you need to have uh, actors that may not have been as as involved or as knowledgeable about blockchain before um, involved, including uh, government. And it, in Argentina, there are a few actors that are actually very involved. Um, a Secretary for Modernization. It's all about blockchain and and. Um, and uh, starting with property records, uh, starting with digital identity, maybe physical identity of goods would be next. Um, but that, all of that come in, has come together. And, and there, um, in, uh, in, in additional thing that we're doing in, uh, apart from that particular use case is also to, to create a, lack, a Latin America-wide um, blockchain platform uh, National actors, consensus, Hyperledger, um, Everest um, entity, and maybe many of, of uh, representatives from those are, are, are in the room. Um, to, in a way that is agnostic <coughs> to the technology, uh, create um, a, a, a railway uh, so that many people can actually use blockchain and offer services in a way that also for the end user 
is not even visible that blockchain is being used. So you don't need to train them on what is blockchain. They just know that you know, something has been sort of automated and is trusted and, and, and you have that traceability. Yeah, thank you very much. And Leon, I think that uh, you are a little bit skeptical to the uh, blockchain's role in uh, supply chain and maybe beyond. Do you think uh, two ladies' view are convincing to you? I think 2.2 .2 million diamonds means that I'm not that skeptical. So, of course, I believe in the technology. Um, as a company, we've um, implemented a full traceability route from the source of mine of diamonds right the way through to the retail network. And as of last week, one of the largest retailers in the world, Chow Tai Fook, uh, for those that are Hong Kong based or Chinese based would understand who they are. They have about 2,500 retail outlets. Um, are now presenting blockchain-enabled diamonds uh, in their store and presenting that to the consumer so the consumer can have the full consciousness of mind around the decision um, around their diamond. So I'm not sceptical, but when you asked me a binary question, I gave you a binary answer, and that is that, of course, blockchain is not, you know, the holy grail of solving every single world problem and it must be joined together in a symphony of, te of technologies. Um, but, what, but what I will say is... What we're discussing here is next generation internet technologies, um, you know, and I think that within two to three years, we're likely not be standing on this stage and talking about blockchain because the reality is we're evolving um, in commerce as a way to understand the importance of constructed safe channels and business networks in a digital realm. And so this is really the birth of the next generation of what the internet means to business. The first generation of the web was about sharing information and communicating. It wasn't necessarily baked in at a transactional trust level. And so this is what we're, what we're going through in our thinking patterns. Yeah, I'm happy that you are um, optimistic for the new generation of technology, but I am skeptical a little bit here because the, uh, uh, everyone believes that the blockchain will be the next generation of the, uh, the biggest technology to replace internet a little bit because the, uh, from the beginning of the internet, we think the internet should be shared, should be decentralized, but now we find that it's a kind of a centralized. Then that's the reason why a lot of the scientists and in, in, in innovators, they come up with a new technology to uh, realize uh, their dream for the uh, decentralization. That is blockchain and that is the Bitcoin, that is the cryptocurrency. So do you think the uh, decentralized uh, framework and the centralized framework can merge together in the long run in terms of the uh, blockchain and the internet and all the generation technology and the new generation technology, very quickly. So I think there's a lot of confusion about what is our blockchain, the blockchain, what's centralized, decentralized, and distributed. They're actually very different things, and we find it's complex. We f <laughs> it's not necessarily yeah. that complex. Actually, it's quite simplistic, but there is a confusion in terms of the understanding and the education behind the terminologies. So one of the parts of the work in the thought leader space for those that are even on this stage is to ensure that we get the primitives of our language correct. Um, so I believe that yes, we are fast forming um, a world upon which we're questioning data. The data of me. I want to know that my data is with me and I have some embellish control over who has the rights to see it, when and how and in what purpose. And the architecture in terms of technology is able now to support many different models of how we handle and secure data. Yeah. Um, so in terms of data, would you share with us maybe example a project that you think is very successful in supply chain uh, utilized by the uh, uh, blockchain technology or other distributed ledger technology? Example, you have been working on that? I mean, I don't want to talk about myself, but I mean, Everledge <laughs> kind of works, really. <laughs> okay, no problem. Then the... Uh, um, Maybe Kathy can talk yeah, about Cassie. something else that's successful. You well, don't have to talk about me either, Kathy. It's okay. No, it's all right. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think actually to, to talk, so I, I'm both a computer scientist and an economist um, for, for my sins, as I usually say. I worked for well over 15 years in industry, uh, in the telecommunications industry, prior to becoming an academic. The concept that the internet is decentralized is probably one of the worst fallacies I have ever heard in my life. So if we could just for once in this room, the internet is sort of decentralized, but it's built on monopolies, guys. I mean, and we all know that. So Cisco, if you want to build a network, you've got to work with Cisco. You've got to buy a Cisco router, right? That there's, it's a lot less decentralized than people think. It's a beautiful 
idea that it's decentralized, but you are using, so let's take, let's take the case of Bitcoin. If people, if Cisco, actually Cisco might go, no, nah, we don't like Bitcoin, we can turn it off. They just turn it off in all of their routers. It's not actually as decentralized as everyone thinks it is. Um, anyway, sorry, that's just, <laughs> as a personal rant of mine, everyone says the internet's decentralized, it's just, just not. Um, all right, sorry. <laughs> um, there, are, there are, and it's a, it's a very good point. What is decentralization? What does decentralization actually really well, maybe mean? Maybe a supply chain first. Uh, uh, what, an example of supply chain? Well, I mean, yeah, so Everledger is the one that I've seen when it, it's up and running. Uh, there's the mask, but that's a very small um, uh, one where they're using it for, for shipping. Um, and I think there was actually one by, done by the CBA, wasn't it? Commonwealth Bank of Australia did one about a year and a half ago. Yep. Thank you. But as an economist, um, uh, maybe you can share with us some uh, um, <laughs> uh, how economics of the blockchain technology for the supply chain, say uh, incentives, say the uh, uh, interests, say the risks, say the regulation, and the governance. So how can we um, make everyone have the incentive to invest into the, uh, the whole, sy whole system and support the uh, rules and the orders of the whole system and everyone want to avoid the, the worst thing, so. Yeah, okay, so um, I think there are two aspects here. So when you're talking about the economics of blockchain, you have two different types of economics. One is the, uh, the economic rewards that you get on a cryptocurrency. So you mine and you get money. So that's just a plain financial reward. In a blockchain solution, much like um, the ones that you see in the supply chain, what you're seeing is incentives. The way to get people to invest in that is really no different from any other technology, if I'm honest. Um, it's basically showing a return on investment to the, to the companies in question. So you ha either have to show a dramatic reduction in cost or a reduction in fraud or you know, uh, new uh, ways to create trade finance, those kind of things. Um, and it's really no different, really, the economics of that to a traditional sort of IT solution, to be honest. Um, but you will see that there is the imperative to share data uh, between companies. What that does do is impact what we you know, call the boundary of the firm. So it changes some of the fundamentals of the economics which governments are generally dealing with on a day-to-day -day business. How do you regulate? So if, if anyone's interested in some of those aspects, you can look at the work that the OECD have been doing. They've done some absolutely fantastic work around blockchain. Um, and what it means for supply chains in terms of antitrust. So is there price collusion happening on the blockchain, which is a, a big problem? Maybe if I can add to that, um, I think the way we see blockchain for supply chains, but also other things, it's, it's really not an end in itself, it's just an enabler. And I think going maybe to the comment on data and so on, the real benefit, so that's just an enabler to ensure that traceability and transparency and trust immutability, which, uh, but, uh, and, and it, it does shift a little bit the paradigm in terms of who owns the data and the ability, for example, if any of, of you here is an exporter, that you then you know, have much more ownership of that data of what happens along the chain and, and can prove it to third parties. And, and, and that, that has, um, I think, a, a strong benefit. But, uh, but it will stay just as basically just an enabler. And I think the real benefits will be in terms of data and AI and how you use that late, you know, much, much more than, than blockchain itself, which would be just a, a, a an enabler to allow for that, uh, for, for that data, to, the way that data gets recorded. Rebecca, would you want to talk a little bit on the incentive and interest in the regulation and governance of the whole system on the blockchain, especially for the supply chain, if you would? Yeah, absolutely. So there are two aspects here. One is uh, the financial incentives that will make this blockchain system actually uh, work uh, and for adoption of this blockchain system to begin with. And then the other bucket that I want to talk about is how exactly you um, enforce governance of this blockchain network from a technology perspective. So I'll start with the first one. Uh, so sort of elaborating on what I've been talking about before uh, with respect to new ways to do supply chain finance using blockchain. Um, so blockchain in this case serves as the bank. Uh, in other words, that's not to say that we cut banks out of the picture, not at all. Banks provide the capital for this sort of transaction. Should be, but should bank be part of that whole system 
and the banks be part of the now. banks have to be part of the ecosystem. Right. Yeah, banks have to be part of the ecosystem. I know that there are initiatives out there to do supply chains entirely on cryptocurrency. That's probably a hundred years from now, um, not tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so banks still have to be a part of the system. Traditional payment rails still have to be part of the system. Um, but the the whole idea is um, banks understand risk, and I think supply chains understand risk very well as well. And the way that blockchain um, completely unlocks a new way of financing is you can have the blockchain own assets. So inventory is a huge problem for all supply chains. The agility of inventory, being able to have stock on hand that you actually need so you can sell it to your end buyer. And when your end buyer doesn't have the demand, you don't want to hold the inventory. Um, so you want the blockchain to hold that instead. So it serves as a third balance sheet for you. That's probably the, the accounting incentive there. Um, but the more important incentive, especially for suppliers, is A, they get paid right away, and B, they get the benefit of the buyer's cost of capital. And with that financial gain, then you can sort of you know, arbitrage a little bit in terms of pricing in the supply chain. Um, but that's the financial incentive for adopting blockchain technology. At least that's the one that we've seen to be the most effective so far within supply chain. Um, with respect to the governance model for blockchain, um, so we, as a default matter, build our products on top of Hyperledger Fabric. It is the most robust blockchain protocol out there for enterprise. Having said that, enterprise Ethereum, I'm sure, will come up with something fantastic. Um, and we're uh, looking at other private blockchains as well. Um, but within supply chain, um, we are, I, I'm sure, Leah has a comment on that. <laughs> um, but with respect to governance of this uh, supply chain ecosystem, I think, um, uh, further to Professor Mulligan's point, it's absolutely true that you can't expect a blockchain system to be completely decentralized. And when you look at private blockchains in particular, decentralization is really, it should not even be mentioned. It's distributed, but it's not um, decentralized. It's not a democracy. Uh, whoever owns this blockchain network is going to decide the governance policies there. Most of the time, it is going to be the large anchor buyer. And then in terms of how the nodes for each of um, the parties in this blockchain network are reconciled between different governance policies, that is still a negotiation process that, frankly, a lot of large supply chain ecosystems have yet to undertake. That is going to be a big project. So for example, if you are Cisco, then you have a ton of market power. But say your contract manufacturer is Foxconn, because Foxconn is the contract manufacturer for the entire electronic supply chain. Foxconn and Cisco, that's an interesting discussion. Foxconn has a lot of blockchain initiatives of their own. Um, I'm sure they have a network of their own nodes. Cisco has a network of their own nodes. Cisco, incidentally, just released their own blockchain. Yeah. Um, so the negotiation between buyers and suppliers and the owners of nodes for this entire blockchain ecosystem, that is a governance discussion that is yet to be had. Um, and I think how that plays out is going to be incredibly interesting. But at the end of the day, it does come back to dollars and cents most of the time. And so the financial incentive that I talked about before is incredibly important for holding this ecosystem together. Thank you very much. Uh, before we open the floor, uh, may I ask the panelists uh, about your view on the, uh, the role of the smart contract on the blockchain uh, ecosystem, on the uh, supply chain system ecosystem? Uh, yeah, so I, I generally say that a smart contract is not smart and it's not a contract. Um, it's, a, it's a new way to build decentralized applications uh, with, without a single point of trust and without a single point of failure. So it's a really nice idea. Um, two things about it. One, I don't think supply chains, can, um, blockchains can really be built without it. Even if you integrate them with other technologies, you need the, the smart contract functionality. Um, and then, you know, the other caveat to that is they are actually extremely dangerous if coded incorrectly, um, in particular in the permissionless systems. In Hyperledger, it's less of a problem, um, but uh, you need very good software engineers to build them. Any different view? Rebecca, smart contract. Well, I, I mean, I think blockchain, um, the smart contracts have been around prior to blockchain. I think that's probably the, the you know, main thing to, to say here. Um, so smart contracts are basically just pieces of code that are agreed upon by two entities. Um, so it has existed prior to blockchain, but why does blockchain work? Most of the time it's because of smart contracts enhanced by cryptography. Um, so you're able to do a lot with smart contracts combined with something else in blockchain. So I'll give you an example in supply chain. Um, so Professor Mulligan, you mentioned the CBA example before. So that was, that was us. Um, and there we got cotton from Texas to China. Um, the way that we were able to take advantage of smart contracts in that case was we placed a GPS sensor on the shipment of cotton itself. Uh, once that cotton reached 
port uh, in China, then the GPS sensor emitted a signal that was signed securely onto the blockchain. That signal was enough to trigger a smart contract to automatically remit payment from the buyer to the supplier. So that entire supply chain process was automated through the use of smart contracts integrated with something else. So I, I think you know you can't really talk about blockchain without smart contracts. Do you think it's dangerous? Do I think it's dangerous? Um, okay, so I have gotten this question a lot, which is what if um, there's human error? Because once something goes onto the blockchain, it can't, it, it's there, it uh, doesn't disappear after that. Whereas if you were to do it in um, uh, normal systems, then you could, in theory, you know, erase it and change it. Um, and that's actually something that blockchain is trying to solve. Uh, so it's true that with a blockchain transaction, if you made a mistake, then you're going to have to overwrite that transaction with yet another transaction. Um, so the danger is sort of mitigated by that. But in terms of whether we um, take out the human error factor to begin with, that's really not a blockchain problem to solve. I think that's an IoT problem to solve. Um, and I think it has to do with, I mean, very traditional uh, technology rails. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, smart contract. Well, just um, I think the, um, the usefulness um, or the scalability in terms of um, making it more widespread in terms of use of smart contracts will depend also on, on, on the governance protocols around uh, blockchain. So that's what we're working quite a lot on in Latin America with this lag chain uh, um, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, validation requirements and uh, per uh, permissions and so forth. So that also, you know, from the beginning in the consortia, you have the right players, including regulators and so on, familiarized why in it, and it reduces also the legal uncertainty that otherwise you could have um, around that. So um, that shouldn't, you know, that should be part of the equation. And the other, and be curious to know, maybe from from the audience as well, but in terms of the security of this all of, of, of this whole thing, we just held yesterday in Washington a, 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 a series on, on quantum computing with entanglement partners, um, just trying to anticipate what could be some of those things that uh, would limit uh, the robustness of blockchain and, and, um, and obviously uh, breaking the code is one of them, and and how long would that take? So uh, I think just keeping 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 that in mind, it is not the holy grail, and mm -hmm. you have to be quite careful uh, in terms of its applications. But again, and just to finish, the more use cases and the more applications that we try out, uh, the more we learn that we build that overall consensus. And and if players like in this case the Inter -Ameri Inter American Development Bank, as as uh, as as a Honest broker is involved. We, we we hope that we can sort of surface the best of it and and create an architecture that will help um, um, get the best the be benefits of it. Thank you, Irene. Liang, would you want to share with us? Well, you know, I think industries at large have really looked at maximizing the economics of their trade. Um, how do I buy it? How do I sell it? How do I make a margin? How do I do it quicker, better, faster, and get it to market to customers and understand who those customers are? So whether you're in the diamond business, the luxury goods space, making handbags, or even uh, manufacturing food, every single industry now um, is, uh, is, is in the data business. <laughs> so... Um, the diamond industry, as a prime example, has an extreme amount of data that has typically been held siloed, but the um, collective nature of that data helps to provide a good uh, digital story enablement for the consumer to make decisions. And smart contracts will be a very interesting horizon where companies and industries begin to think about the the digital enablement of their goods as much as the physical enablement of their goods. And there, of course, are economics. So we do speak about the data and who owns it. I don't think about that. I think about who's using the data and how, what are the economics, the permissions, the rights around that data. And so what does that data then mean in terms of value? And if you think about uh, a very simplistic view, how do you want to present that on a data menu? So if I go to a restaurant and I want to choose a certain uh, type of meal and I want to add bacon and add cheese, what's the cost of adding bacon and adding cheese to, to, to my meal? And if you think about that and you can bake that into a data contract amongst participants on a network, then there is an incredible amount 
of new formed data enabled businesses built on top of existing supply chains or existing industries um, that should really be thinking about where a data company that happens to cut, polish and sell diamonds. Not where a diamond company and we happen to have all this data kind of sitting around. Yeah. Then the, uh, what about the role of the standards? If we have a proper standards, maybe that the smart contract would not be that dangerous. Cathy? Standards won't help you with that. Um, sorry to, to be so negative, sorry. I'm really quite negative about standards in blockchain. Um, I think that it's far too early to go for standards in blockchain. I think what we should be looking at, uh, to be perfectly honest, is training our software engineers better. So in civil engineering and uh, law and many other industries, when you get out of university, you're still not qualified to actually practice. You're not allowed to build a bridge uh, as a civil engineer until you've done, I think it's two years and an accreditation by an external professional body. I think that software um, and the impact of software is now becoming so deeply embedded into our society, society not just through blockchain, uh, but IoT, all of these kind of things, that it is actually becoming a, um, something that's profoundly dangerous in the wrong hands, not because people are nefarious, but because they are just not good software engineers. Uh, so we need to help, you know, when, when they come out of university, we need to make sure that there's an accreditation or an audit procedure for the software, the actual code um, that is built by these, these software engineers. So I think it's a, it's a problem, not just for blockchain, but for society. I see, then in terms of the uh, um, um, digital currency, Let's talk a little bit uh, uh, f about the uh, central banking digital currency because everyone is um, uh, very much uh, uh, encouraged, encouraging that smart contract can play a bigger role in the monetary policy in the long run. Are you also skeptical on that? Um, on the uh, central banker or on the engineering? Well, it's, it's still the same problem that somebody needs to build that contract. Right. So if we think back to, to the DAO hack, when the DAO hack happened, mm. if you looked at the code, it was actually two lines of code that should have been the other way around. It was that simple um, that allowed you know, that person to then fleece, what was that, how many hundreds of million? 50 million or something? Yeah. Okay. So you know, that's a very simple error. And if you think about the fact that those contracts that would be built for a central bank application may actually have profound implications on a, a country's uh, you know, economic financial stability, uh, it, it, it for me becomes even more critical. Um, so it's not that I am skeptical about the application. I, th I can see the vision and I can really understand why we would want to potentially do those kind of things. Um, but it is actually how do we ensure that they are you know, infallible contracts? And, and that is hard to do. So still a society issue. Yeah, and the other one is macroeconomic policy, right? So how do you control if you for velocity and are you in an inflationary economy or a deflationary economy? But those are sort of bigger issues, not related to yeah, the bigger technology. issues beyond our uh, <laughs> topic today. So we uh, just retreat back to uh, supply chain. So I would like to open the floor, and I know a lot of experts here on supply chain and on the blockchain distributed ledger. Uh, do you have some comment or a question or anything? Uh, please uh, identify who you are and, uh, yeah, please. The gentleman. <laughs> uh, I'm San, I'm from Silicon Valley Bay, Bay Area and it's very interesting to hear, finally, there is very tangible application of blockchain and supply chain. Uh, I do work at a company that we actually produce our own, our, our own, our own hardware and IoT. And a lot of my friends in uh, Apple's or Elementum's or Enaplans, and they're tackling supply chain from the software perspective on how to create more efficiency. So I have a question to you, uh, Rebecca. Um, since you're working at a for-profit company, implementing a solution to the supply chain, um, what, what, what is your main focus? Which company, let's say like the Foxconn and Cisco example you brought up, um, where in this whole ecosystem that there can be the first commercialized end-to-end -end service can be out there and what's, what's the skew chain focus on, let's say you're trying to let's build a platform for a big company like Apple or Cisco or more so on like Foxconn's of the ecosystem. I'm just curious, 
where do you see um, the market will will um, will will have some service in the market, and then what's your company's focus on it right now? That's a great question. First of all, we are neutral. Uh, so uh, between Apple and Foxconn, we love them both. We don't take any sides. Um, but having said that, the economic reality of it is when you are talking about supply chain, the player with the most power within a supply chain is going to be the large buyer. So it's going to be the Apples, the Samsungs of the world. Foxconn, because of its unique position, has an incredible amount of market power as well. Um, usually that power is displayed in how it pushes back against its buyers. But having said that, the buyer is the one who drives the supply chain. Now, how supply chain adopts blockchain is actually not in a terribly organized way. I would say that the um, first thing that companies look at is, is there a pain point in my supply chain? You know, they hear about blockchain technology, but the discussion very quickly goes to what is the pain point that I'm trying to solve? You know, do I have supply outages all the time? Do I spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year on reconciliation of my records? Um, do I have suppliers who just can't get financing and they go bankrupt and therefore, you know, that is risk to my supply chain? Am I not able to get critical components? Lots of pain points and entry points for where blockchain can provide value. And depending on where those pain points emerge, it could be that the supplier is the one who's bringing the technology to their buyer. It could be the buyer who's implementing this technology for their supply chain. Um, so it's really not terribly organized uh, how blockchain gets adopted. Um, but having said that, the economic reality is the buyer has to say yes at the end of the day. Yeah, thank you. Any more inputs? Um, anyone of you? Um, yeah. Yes, please. Hello, thanks for joining us. I, I wanted to know, maybe from each of the panelists, maybe the most unique, I'll just choose the word unique, use case that you've come across for the use of blockchain in supply chains. Creative, maybe that's a better word. Uh, uh, well, I mean, the, my, mine doesn't have anything to do with blockchain, um, but I, uh, I, I did a three-year research project, actually, on supply chains. And I, I, I stumbled across a micro enterprise in London who was coordinating her su entire supply chain. So she was a one person enterprise, coordinated her entire supply chain using Twitter. So basically, her buy and sell uh, for her supply chain was done with a hashtag, said edible flowers, hash, you know, hashtag edible flowers, hashtag buy. And I suddenly realized that's when I actually realized that digital technologies, very small ones, were going to have a profound impact on the way we organize supply chains. Um, and, and you know, the, this idea of the micro supply chain has a profound impact, actually, I think. Um, and you can see blockchain play, playing a role in that to help track and trace uh, you know, and coordinate between micro enterprises. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, any of you? Um, yes. Yeah, we're, we're embarking on a project now with Climate Kick um, to understand how the rising concern of climate change will affect um, our ability across the planet to provide maize and grain to feed all of us. Um, and that typically large companies, for example, a cereal company like Kellogg's, look at their supply chain in a way of providing resilience. But we think about how can we build uh, anti-fragility into supply chains. So is there a way to understand the reconfiguration of a supply chain if there's a catastrophe event that occurs? I mean, we just came from Hong Kong two days ago and there was a typhoon. Um, if that hit the food belt of Australia, we would be in a fairly significant place of hurt. And not only uh, would Australia be hurting, but we export a fair amount of our agriculture to China. So how can we uh, use the technology in a way to then um, still understand the DNA sequencing of you know, primary ingredients um, and, and then enable anti-fragility to be built into a supply chain with immediacy and, and, and put that into the hands of the, the large food manufacturers? Um, so, of course, the foreign trade one-stop shop in Argentina, uh, the case that you have on the table with the fourth industrial revolution of the web is exciting because it's solving a very specific pain point uh, in terms of uh, export permits and, 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 uh, and it's a very tangible benefit uh, that, uh, um, 
that we're seeing, so that, that's exciting. But I, I'm very hopeful that we can, we can also uh, look at um, the whole agribusiness supply chains, uh, Latin America being the largest net exporter of agriculture in the world. Uh, that's an area where there are so many inefficiencies and where I was recently in Minas Gerais in Brazil, um, an area that used to supply through small farmers um, milk to Danone and other major producers, and they are disappearing every single day because they can't stay competitive. And I think blockchain is not the only solution, but it can be an enabler together with IoT and sensing of improving the productivity, traceability, and getting more value to those farmers if you uh, have traceability in terms of origin of the milk and, the, and, and, and labeling it as organic milk and so forth. And, and so I think I see a future, a more promising future for those small farmers, uh, and, and, and there is a huge potential of application uh, across the agribusiness supply chains in, in the region. So uh, I'm actually gonna go a little bit outside the scope of this session and the question to flip it a little bit. So um, what we're starting to do is take the technology that we've developed within supply chain to track and trace the production of goods to the distribution end of things. So in the same way that we can track and trace goods as they're being produced, um, we can also track and trace how consumers are using those goods, using the exact same blockchain technology. And so in that way, you can marry your distribution end and production ends, which for a lot of companies are siloed um, off from one another, uh, but blockchain has the potential to coordinate all of that. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so I, uh, maybe I would like to uh, um, uh, ask one gentleman who writes a word uh, at the beginning of our session, then now maybe you think that word is not irrelevant now and you want to uh, maybe write a new word. Any of you? Okay, maybe later. Back to the lady and back to the panels. So um, I, I would like to uh, ask you questions about the uh, uh, role of the uh, government because it's a, a little bit controversial, I know, in maybe in this uh, kind of discussion, but still, um, in China's context, governments play a, a very big role and a very crucial role here. In terms of the supply chain, in terms of the trade finance, in terms of blockchain, uh, I know there's an experiment in China now, in the uh, uh, southern China, in Guangdong, and in um, and, and and uh, yeah, Hong Kong and Macau, and now they, uh, uh, the central bank entity in the Shenzhen, and they are just a, uh, a pioneering a project to put all the uh, uh, trade um, entities and the uh, old company, private company together and also the banking together and to set up a platform for the trade finance of this big region. So the government play this role. But maybe in, in, in the rest of the world, the private sector play that role. So my question for you is that, how do you look at the, uh, the role of the government in terms of the supply chain, blockchain, and all this trade finance issue, and especially in China's uh, environment? Maybe, yeah, Cathy? Uh, well, I was just gonna say, in my experience, the government plays a key role, uh, not just in China, um, uh, but you know, places like Singapore, um, it, it actually, all, all governments, I think, are very interested in how trade finance works in, in their country. So I don't think it's just China. But it's an important role. But, but do you think that this role should be uh, left to the private, or uh, it's good or it's better for the government to play this uh, uh, service bus role to, to, to have the platform and everything, and so the private sector can just go to, get on the bus to, to have the everything get down? Well, I think that actually, um, you know, if you would like to ensure inclusiveness in trade finance and supply chains, there is a role for government because you want to ensure that your smaller companies are able to access that. Um, so the large companies will probably not have such a huge problem accessing trade finance and, you know, maybe creating their own platforms or, or whatever if you leave it, leave it to the private sector. But the smaller companies are the ones who need access to that and need help. So I think there's definitely a role um, for government there. I, I agree. I think there, there is definitely a role because, again, you know, blockchain is just the enabler and in reality we're talking about data and data and ethics and, and there, I mean, they have to be part of the conversation and part of the equation to get that, uh, to, to, to get that right, let alone, I mean, just the simple thing of uh, giving some um, regulatory certainty to or, or, or predictability um, uh, to these transactions and if they're totally out of the picture um, 
you may be doing something that tomorrow they say, oh, it's, it's illegal. So I think when from the beginning you design those governance protocols and, and, the, and they are part of a conversation, they will be more um, understanding, more knowledgeable, and they can, they can provide laser legal certainty as well. Um, and, and I don't know, for in Latin America, we, we see the preparedness of the government in the conversation at different levels. Uh, we have here Silvia Chevy from Uruguay. Uruguay is one of the most uh, uh, open governments to this, so I don't know if you have anything to, to add. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Your view? Um, I mean, the reality is that the, the governments in the world are some of the largest employers of people on the planet. You know, they're, they're interested in, in trade exchange, um, in employment, in health, I across the entire spectrum of humanity. So um, this technology, as we mentioned before, is next generation internet technology. So as a part of that, it's completely persuasive across every element of, 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 of digital type of trade. Um, I think what's going to be interesting is, you know, the construct of the world has had border force controls. We, we have boats to protect our borders for taxes and tariffs. And, and now when we think about from a digital uh, construction um, level, particularly in uh, not decentralization, but distributed by true nature, how will governments tax and tariff uh, in, a in a digital economy, in a digital world? Um, and, and that's a very large part of the driven, uh, driven nature of conversations at a government end. Yeah, so the governance of the digital economy is an even, even bigger problem that we, uh, we need to solve in, in down the road. Uh, Rebecca, your view on the government role in the uh, trade finance, in the supply chain? I mean, the very simple answer, which I think has been um, elucidated by all the panelists so far, is that there is a role, absolutely. Uh, government has scale and initiative that private enterprise cannot um, manage still. Um, you know, I was having an interesting conversation with someone uh, this morning who works in AI, and we were talking about with these new innovations like blockchain, like AI, um, the mentality of innovators is um, move fast and break things. Um, so this is you know, something that Kathy was talking about in terms of training your software engineers to be better engineers, frankly. Um, but when you're trying to build a prototype, get to market fast and get adoption of your technology, sometimes you know, a few years down the line, you'll find things in your code that are just you know, making you susceptible to incredible vulnerabilities, or not even just security vulnerabilities, but somehow the system um, is now having unintended consequences. So Facebook is a famous example of this. People thought we're just connecting um, people all over the world. It sounds like a very innocuous mission. Uh, and it turns out that the data that um, can be gathered from that uh, can be used for nefarious purposes. And so I think um, one thing that government can do is sort of remind the innovators in this space, you know, these are the considerations that you have to take into account. These are the regulations that we're considering. And it's something where government, I think, has taken a good approach with respect to blockchain so far and been proactive about their own projects, but also listening to the blockchain community and understanding the technology better before implementing any sort of new regulations. But yes, I think that there needs to be an active conversation between public and private so that we don't get into this space of just moving fast and breaking things and coming up with technology that we're frankly going to regret later. Actually, there's a very good book named, a title is a Moving Fast and Break Things. I think a lot of the governance issue, regulation uh, issue here, but it's more of broad in our discussion today. So when I ask you the, the role of the government here, uh, I uh, have a uh, uh, observation starting point is that uh, scalability issue is a big issue for the blockchain distributed ledger. If we don't have a, a big enough ecosystem the investors and also the private sector, private company who invested into the whole platform, it is very difficult to be uh, profitable. Then it is not sustainable. So at this moment, so the government may step in and just uh, initiate the whole system. Is that a, a, a good model or maybe there's no need for government to do that? Kathy? Um, so are you asking around, you know, if a blockchain solution has failed, should the government step in? Depends what the blockchain solution really is. I mean, if, if it fails, I would question the validity of building it in the first place, if I'm honest, um, because you should, uh, every time you build a piece of technology, be thinking through what is the sustainable business model associated with this. Um, it, so your hint that there's no need for the government to, to step in? 
Um, well, it depends on why it's failed. In your theoretical situation, why is the blockchain failed? It is a scalability issue. It is very difficult for the private sector to sustain. In a period of time, then maybe everyone will give up. Then we don't have the uh, service of the uh, trick finance or uh, uh, Liang, you have a view the there? The well. government won't <laughs> step in. I mean, yeah. it's not their role to step into a failed technical implementation or a technology that doesn't see, you know, doesn't see past an embryonic state. And, we, and we've seen this before, whether it be in RFID or, you know, WAP, which is a wide area protocol network, you know, before SMS sort of took a hold. There's, there's no possible way that a government would step in, would step in on, on any realm. It will just naturally die uh, on, on, on the vine and, and a new set of constructed technologies will, will rise to replace what was uh, never going to be a, pro a product market fit. So there's absolutely no way. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Um, and uh, in the places where we've seen the government stepping in a bit more, it's been at the later stage. Uh, so for example, in, I'm from Spain. Um, in Spain, I don't know if you're familiar with Alastria, so that's a, a public-private consortia. Now it has more than 250 members. It started very small. It started by the, actually by the, by the programmers and, and, and the blockchain community, and then starting adding some of the big corporates and then some of the, 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 other, the other players. Now most of the, the, the time spent is, is actually by lawyers um, by, because of you know, the need to define those protocols and so on. Um, so they've gotten involved at the later stage, and I think al having allowed or, or having seen, seen that much more decentralized sort of spontaneous creation is, is, the, is the way to go for, for most countries. Yeah, I think it's a very a good question that infrastructure provider should be private or part of the public. Yeah, I mean, some of the best wines you could drink in the world are grafted from different rootstock. And I think that that, from a technology standpoint, is probably going to be the, the natural... Yeah. Yeah. Rebecca, your view? Infrastructure, provider, should be purely private or maybe sometime public should have a big role there? Well, I think that, I mean, um, the right answer generally is both. Um, but I have to agree with the ladies on the panel that if there is a failure in infrastructure, um, then it really is a failure of that technology. And frankly, I don't think that government has the tools to correct for it, even if they wanted to. Um, and, and so that places the responsibility on private um, to make sure the technology is robust. Um, and fortunately for a lot of these technologies, you have to arrive at product market fit uh, in order to be able to grow as a technology and as an industry. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean simple th terms. But think about the building code. Um, you know, we were building houses 20 years ago with asbestos in roofs and in walls. Um, and clearly, that's not the right product. There was an after effect that, of course, caused a number of health concerns. So, you know, the government didn't step in then and all of a sudden say, I'm going to fund, pay and, and reinvent, uh, you know, a next generation replacement to asbestos. And it's the same thing in, in a digital innovation space than what it is in a physical product space. I think there is a caveat. So there's one caveat to this. So for me, blockchain is not a national infrastructure. It's an industrial level infrastructure. What we see, for example, is, however, different responses to what are national infrastructure. So water supply, generally considered national infrastructure. We see today, however, that you know, communications technology is starting to be considered a national sort of um, requirement, shall we say. It's not considered national infrastructure, but what you see government doing there is setting the rules for engagement. So how does the market function? So for example, spectrum auctions um, you know, for, for mobile technologies or something like that. So it really depends on whether you would view blockchain as a national infrastructure or not. Um, Estonia, for example, does. It depends. I well, Estonia does consider it. And they didn't just, um, they actually what, went out and helped fund the development of their um, you know, X-Road architecture. but. Um, you know, is that fully what everyone else wants to do? Probably not. Many other countries will want to rely on the market to deliver those kind of infrastructures. I think the big question, you know, I, um, in, in uh, a year ago or so, um, I was in the council to consider the future for 2030. Um, and a part of that work was around the 
the global commons. So what is the global commons? You know, the seven wonders of the world and Australia is the Great Barrier Reef and it's our responsibility to ensure that it's here to be preserved for generations to come. Um, you know, and we have a tragedy in Australia with the Great Barrier Reef that we're all actively solving for. But one of the big questions I had in the conversation topic that I led was we now have a digital global commons. Um, the internet is one of those things. AI, of course, and constructs around, um, around algorithms is also a digital global commons. And I question whether blockchain or the primitives around cryptography that are currently being used, will that stretch out to be a digital global commons for all to be used? And if that's the case, then how do we, from global council's perspective, um, you know, Davos type level, com you know, commentary, G20, Chogum, all of these conversations um, we've been able to participate in have now had this sort of sense of reasoning that potentially we should think about our digital world in just as much importance as it is for the seven wonders of the world that we hold today or the plastics in our oceans. And so how do we get a pulse on that? But how do you re reconcile that with the fact that AI is developed by mega, 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 mega companies? How can you say it's a global commons? I mean, there's a fundamental difference between a global, you know, public good, if you will, of the ocean, making sure that that's what, I don't know, plastic free, and saying that AI is a digital commons when it's but, but built. But isn't there a tension between open source and sorry, our, our, our pan, sorry, our panel is not for AI, and maybe <laughs> next time we will join you in the AI uh, session. So I think it's time uh, for us maybe a uh, wrap up. So before I uh, wrap up, uh, I'm wondering if any of you want to have a uh, comment or a question. Yes, please, gentlemen. No, oh, many of you. Yes, I'm... Uh, we don't have enough time, so maybe I'm very quickly. I'm from QI Group, but just have a question. Do you see more investment in blockchain nowadays or compare, for example, the big here. Okay, investment. So especially from uh, public factor and private factor. Yeah, maybe we collect all the questions first. Lady? It's a comment about the government thing. In Uruguay, the government is uh, planning to use blockchain for their own pay points uh, to make uh, e-government or digital, digital government for the citizens. So uh, that's why that, that's what the initiative. I remember there's a, another hand. Yes, please. Uh, my question was on the marketing side, so on the sell side of the benefits. I'm pretty clear on the cost advantages of using blockchain. I should have mentioned I work in the jewelry business. Um, so I'm clear in terms of speed, in terms of cost, chain of custody, all of that on the cost side. I'm wondering if you guys have seen examples of companies using blockchain already to be able to tell the story to a customer about the specific product that um, they, they're buying. Yeah, so uh, because we only have a few minutes left, I think that we uh, just uh, uh, incorporate all the questions uh, that the gentlemen and ladies come in here, and also we back to the main question that we raised at the beginning of our session. Uh, may I uh, just uh, highlight that what is the most needed what is the most needed for us to accelerate the blockchain and other distributed ledger technology to bring efficiency, transparency, and interoperability to global supply chain, or maybe even bigger for the, for the global community? So uh, just a final word and a concluding, a concluding mark. Rebecca, very quick. So if I can remember all the questions. Um, so the first one, is there more investment now uh, versus more investment last year or so? So I would say the hype cycle is over for blockchain. I think people are expecting results. Uh, but in terms of investment, I think larger companies uh, are like Microsoft, IBM, et cetera, are increasing their investment in blockchain uh, for their own uh, intercompany projects. Um, with respect to whether there is blockchain investment across the industry in terms of venture capital, for example, uh, I don't see a spike in that this year. It's probably going to be the same level as last year. Um, now, I expect that to increase, uh, if only because towards the end of this year and early 2019 is when you're going to start to see production deployments of blockchain systems. And I think that tangibility is going to increase the investment in that space. Um, with respect to the question about whether you can leverage a blockchain technology that's used in the supply chain for marketing purposes. Um, so we uh, don't do it in the jewelry space, we do it in the food and agriculture space. So telling the story to your consumers, rewarding a company for having gone through the trouble of making their supply chain sustainable and then allowing their consumers to see not only that um, their goods, their food, et cetera, do come from this particular source, but if they wanted to communicate with that source, they would be able to do that as well through the blockchain. So yes, yeah. there's that.
Thank you. Very quickly, final word. What is more needed? Um, Maybe not answering questions. What yeah, so the, the, uh, the difference, uh, what would make a difference is not to evangelize. I think there's a lot of evangelization on blockchain. To actually get on with it, try it, apply it, use cases, talk about them, learn from it, and, and, uh, and uh, do it at a, you know, at a global level because we don't need to reinvent the wheel in silos in different countries. Yeah, Leon, final word? Okay. Cathy, final word. No, I think it's all been said. Basically, get on with it, stop talking, do it. Okay, from a uh, talking to action, let's go home and work. Thank you very much. Uh, please join me with a big applause for the uh, panel and also for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>